In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let us make man in our image. The Bible calls him Adam, one man who fathered us all. Now, genetics points to a scientific Adam. Microscopic clues in our DNA link every man on Earth back to one man, one common ancestor. To understand how this could be, we must discover scientific Adam's lost Eden. Enter his world and look him in the eye at an unexpected crossroads of Bible and biology. We're headed on a search for Adam. so different. The idea that we're all related seems impossible. It's hard to believe that six billion people all share the same ancestor. Yet three of the world's great religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, believe in one man who fathered us all. That makes Adam a key figure in the beliefs of more than half the world. Now, science offers a chance to find a genetic Adam. A single ancestor whose DNA survives in every man on Earth today. From the Inuit of the Arctic, to the Amerindians of the Amazon, from the nomads of the desert, to the businessmen of Wall Street. Spencer Wells, a geneticist with National Geographic, will lead us on a journey to identify the scientific Adam and reveal what made him so exceptional that he could father all men on Earth. But how do you unravel a chain so many generations long? chain that leads all the way to the roots of humanity's family tree. I really need a tool, a kind of time machine to allow me to do that, a genetic time machine. Geneticists have developed just such a tool, a way to follow DNA trails deep into the past. Our search for Adam will uncover genetic secrets of an unexpected cast of characters. One of the greatest warriors in history. One of America's founding fathers. Even an Ethiopian prince who claims to be descended from an ancient biblical king. What links these men to scientific Adam? Their DNA. Most of our DNA is a jumble from all our ancestors. It's what makes each of us unique. But there's a section of our genetic code that stays almost constant. The Y chromosome, the special piece of DNA that only men have. It's passed virtually unchanged from father to son, like a family name. The Y chromosome links the men of today with the men who lived in the past. This tiny piece of DNA allows us to travel back in time through humanity's history. These days, we use DNA to test whether a man is the biological father of a child. Could it really link the billions of men alive today back to one ancestor? Wells believes the answer is yes. That the Y chromosome can trace the origins of men from all over the world. From Africa to America, all the branches on the tree join up in one trunk. The Y chromosome links men today back to their common ancestors. The key is to reveal super ancestors, 
men who left their genetic imprint on huge numbers. They're like branching points, where vast sections of the tree come together in a single man. Geneticists can trace them further and further back down the tree to the ultimate super ancestor, scientific Adam. This is a scientific quest, yet the idea behind our search was first written down in a document of faith, the Bible. Thousands of years before genetics, the book of Genesis tells of one man who fathered us all. The Bible gives no physical description of Adam, saying only that he's created out of dust in God's image. Adam's rib provides the raw material for the first woman, Eve. God gives them a home, the Garden of Eden. But soon, tempted by a serpent, Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge and are cast out of paradise. Adam and Eve have children, and according to the Bible, this one family has grown to include everyone on earth today. The New Testament's Gospel of Luke lays out Adam's family tree generation by generation. But what if we tested someone today who claims to be linked to that lineage? Most of the people the Bible places on Adam's family tree have disappeared without a trace. Yet one stands out as a significant historical figure, Solomon, the third king of Israel. Even today, there are people who claim to be directly descended from Solomon, the Ethiopian royal family. It seems far-fetched. The Jerusalem of Solomon is 1,500 miles from Ethiopia. But the Ethiopians claim to have an extraordinary piece of physical evidence that ties them to the Holy Land. The Ark of the Covenant was believed to contain the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the Word of God. Legend says it was kept in a temple built by Solomon in Jerusalem. Until it was taken by Solomon's son, Menelik, and later brought to a little church in Aksum in northern Ethiopia. Today, the Ethiopian royal family claims direct descent from Menelik, and so from Solomon. If that's true, their family tree connects directly to the biblical lineage of Adam. To test that lineage, we'll need a royal who'll cooperate. In 1974, Ethiopia's emperor Haile Selassie was deposed. The royal family fled into exile. We tracked down a prince who agreed to participate in our search on one condition. We can't reveal his identity. He wants to avoid accusations that he's using his link to Solomon to reclaim the throne. The prince takes a secret DNA test. A few tiny cheek cells transport us deep into the past. The DNA can reveal where the prince's ancestors came from. Could it link him to Solomon? The results are tantalizing. The prince's Y chromosome mutations do lend support to his claim. They point to Middle Eastern ancestry, but it's not definitive proof. Jumbo. <laughs> Jumbo. <laughs> History has created a genetic melting pot. And by taking a sample of your DNA, of your genes, we can say something about the people you're related to in the past, your ancestors. If the Y chromosomes here lead to a common ancestor for all these ethnic groups, they could lead us to Adam. 
could open your mouth. Wells takes samples from 25 local men. Correct. Thank you. Okay. You could open your mouth. Where was your mother born? See you. See you. DNA analysis proves there are men on pate from all over the place. Thank you. With ancestors from Africa, Europe, Arabia, India, and the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. There is more genetic variation on this tiny island of Pate than in many countries. And the samples show something critical. They point to a new super ancestor. Even though the Y chromosomes come from all over the world, they almost all have something in common. A particular mutation that scientists call M168. In fact, men all over the planet share this mutation. Genghis Khan and the San Francisco Mongolians have it. Thomas Jefferson has it. Wells himself has it. Nearly three billion men share this mutation. And it means they're all descended from one man. It's a staggering thought. Genghis Khan could have fathered millions. But the man who first had this genetic mutation had billions of descendants. We're near the bottom of the tree. Could this man, M168, be Adam? There's only one problem. On the Kenyan island of Pate, Spencer Wells found one man who doesn't fit. His Y chromosome doesn't have the critical mutation. It's a crucial clue. And he's not the only one. There are others who are not descended from M168. So he can't be Adam. M-168 is far down the tree, but not its base. And the Y chromosome from the odd man out on Pate gives us the final piece of our puzzle. The man's lineage originates in East or South Africa. Comparing this Y chromosome to thousands of men from all over the world reveals a critical discovery. These mutations originating in Africa appear on every Y chromosome in every man in the world today. These are the universal mutations we've been looking for. We followed the DNA trail all the way to the bottom of the tree. Every branch leads to one man, one Y chromosome. There must have been one man gave rise to all men alive today. He is the ultimate super ancestor. He is scientific Adam. One of his descendants was M168. He was the forefather of the ancient Middle Eastern ancestor of Thomas Jefferson. He gave rise to Genghis Khan's Y chromosome. In fact, all the Y chromosomes in the world trace back to this one African man. He is scientific Adam. Wells believes the pattern of African Y chromosomes puts his birthplace somewhere in the Great Rift Valley region of East Africa, perhaps Tanzania or Ethiopia. He thinks this is scientific Adam's homeland, his Garden of Eden. Genetics can date the ancient Y chromosome mutations to calculate the age of scientific Adam. Wells believes he was born around 60,000 years ago. It sounds ancient. But it means our search for a common ancestor has not led us all the way back to a time of ape men. Or even to primitive beings like Homo erectus. Compared to the billions of years of human evolution, we've found Adam in the recent past. 
science can't tell for sure what set Adam apart. There were other men who lived alongside him. But over the centuries, all the other men's lines died out. Maybe some had only daughters, or no children at all. Their Y chromosomes were lost forever. Only Adam's lineage survives. Here's how Adam could have become our ultimate super ancestor. Sometime around 60,000 years ago, Adam is born. He's a fast learner, and in time, he proves himself as a leader of his tribe. His command of language sets him apart. Perhaps he invents new and more lethal weapons. Or takes charge of the hunts, devising new strategies. He's much better than the other guys at providing for his family and the tribe. And this makes him popular with the ladies. He has more children than the others. His sons inherit not just his smarts, but of course his Y chromosome. Like Genghis Khan and his sons, Adam's Y chromosome begins to spread through the population. And Adam's intelligence gives his sons the ability to leave Africa and populate the world. Around 50,000 years ago, we start to expand out of Africa. Some populations start to leave around that time, and very rapidly, they reach places as far afield as Australia, perhaps within a couple of thousand years. A couple of thousand years is like the blink of an eye. And Wells can trace it all back to one scientific atom. This is not the man God creates in the book of Genesis. But now, thousands of years after the Bible was written, science has confirmed the essence of its story. There was one man whose DNA survives in every man on Earth today. His Garden of Eden was likely East Africa. Other humans came before him, but only after him did we become truly modern. Scientific Adam unites all men today. From Bono to Nelson Mandela. From Tiger Woods to David Beckham. From Osama Bin Laden to the Dalai Lama. of coded information that codes for the structure and function of the human body. Half of that DNA comes from an individual's mother and the other half from the father. But because both halves are shuffled together, it's difficult to identify which parent contributed which element. Mitochondrial DNA is different. It's found outside the nucleus of the cell where there are hundreds of little energy producing components called mitochondria. Each of these mitochondria contains a circular strand of DNA that's contributed exclusively by the mother. Because mitochondrial DNA remains relatively unchanged, it can be used to trace a person's lineage back for thousands of years, and perhaps even to the beginning of time. The uproar about mitochondrial DNA really began back in 1987 when a study was conducted by researchers at UC Berkeley which compared the mitochondrial DNA of 147 people from five of the world's geographic locations. Based on the results of the study, researchers concluded that all of the 147 people had the same female ancestor, an individual that's become known as the mitochondrial Eve. Do these findings actually prove the biblical story of Adam and Eve? Or is there another explanation, one that's more in line with the theory of evolution? The mitochondrial DNA evidence can mean one of two things. In the beginning, there really was one set of parents, which would mean that mitochondrial Eve could be the biblical Eve, or all modern humans are descended from a very small population of humans that existed at one time. Evolutionists theorize that the original group of humans contained more than one woman, so it had several sources for mitochondrial DNA. However, the DNA for all but one of the sources became extinct 
when subsequent generations failed to produce any female offspring. Therefore, the mitochondrial Eve is simply the one and only female of the original population whose offspring have provided a continuous supply of female descendants. The mitochondrial Eve evidence does not force the belief that there was only one woman from whom we all descended, but, and this is very important, it is most definitely consistent with it. And of course, this is something that evolutionists never expected they'd have to deal with. So in order to explain away the possibility of the biblical Eve, they've had to come up with a very far-fetched explanation about mitochondrial Eve. Their explanation is that her family somehow spread across the globe and replaced all the other archaic humans who just happened to have failed in their efforts to produce human female offspring. Now that's pretty hard to swallow. The news that mitochondrial DNA might prove the existence, or at least the possibility, of the biblical Eve sent shockwaves through the scientific community. How could all humans be descended from one individual if our species was supposedly evolving all over the world? But there was another fact to deal with. Mitochondrial DNA evidence was about to reveal the time frame in which this common ancestor lived. Would this piece of information support the prevailing scientific wisdom or deal it another blow? Evolutionists were very aware of the way in which the mitochondrial Eve discovery could have been seen to have vindicated the Bible. So they countered this supposition with proof that the mitochondrial Eve lived far too long ago to be the biblical Eve. This belief was based on something called a molecular clock. The molecular clock theory proposes that mutations in the mitochondrial DNA of humans occur at a certain rate, and when we compare the genetic material of various groups of people who are alive today, we find certain differences in the genetic code that result from those mutations. By rewinding the genetic clock, scientists came up with an estimated rate of mutation and thus were able to calculate the supposed age of mitochondrial Eve. The first surprise that evolutionists got from the molecular clock was that Eve existed approximately 250,000 years ago. Evolutionists have been saying for years that our common ancestor was an ape-like creature who lived some three and a half million years ago. And in their view, it required millions of years for our supposed evolutionary ancestors to evolve into humans. But there's this molecular clock which they devised, telling them that this all happened in a time frame of just 250,000 years. In effect, the molecular clock threw the evolutionary clock out the window. Faced with what seemed to be an impossible date for the origin of mankind, researchers went back to the lab to determine if any mistakes had been made. Perhaps a miscalculation had thrown off their molecular clock. But would a recalibration lead them to dates that would support the theory of evolution, or would it push them even closer to the biblical time frame? Scientists who felt that the molecular clock dates for mitochondrial Eve were out of line were in for an even bigger surprise in 1998. New discoveries were made which indicate that mutations in mitochondrial DNA occur even more rapidly than previously thought. In fact, the latest DNA research shows that mutations occur 20 times faster than the original estimate. That means that the mitochondrial Eve lived between 6,000 and 6,500 years ago.